So today we have the long awaited episode of Rachel and is it Jankovic? I've, I've heard it Jankovic. Jankovic. Okay, that wow. sounds more realistic. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but Rachel, I'm so excited to have her on the podcast today. Elisha and I were lo- really looking forward to this interview, and I know that a lot of our in-person friends were too. And so I hope that you guys are encouraged. If you aren't familiar with Rachel, she is the author of Loving the Little Years and a few other books, but I would really encourage you guys check out that Loving the Little Year book if you are in the trenches of motherhood right now. It's an incredible perspective when she has, I believe, five little kids and twins thrown in there. It was just really had a lot going on in her life. Anyways, you guys are going to love this episode. We talk about raising teens, connecting with daughters, especially teen daughters, um, navigating. What are some of the other things we talk about in this episode? Social media uh, with teens and uh, their current stance on that being a, a integral part of their community, what hospitality hospitality looks like on a large scale, like quite a large scale. Yeah. And yeah, just preparing your kids. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. In fact, I know that you will. If you do, feel free to share it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, leave a rating or a review. If you've been around for a while, you know what to do. Also, I wanted to let you guys know about uh, Summit, Homeschool Summits. We actually had the honor of getting asked to be on a online homeschool summit event. Some of you have already registered for it and were surprised to see us on there. And actually, Rachel is also on there as a speaker as well. It's an incredible lineup. Nancy Campbell, you guys know I've really been encouraged by her. She's a speaker at this event and it's totally online. So this is a relational lifestyle summit. It's from a Christian perspective and Christian worldview. So if you're looking for encouragement in your marriage, or, you know, raising your children or homeschooling or all of the above, then check it out. Again, it's an incredible speaker panel and we're just really honored to be a part of that. And it's all online. So wherever you are in the world, you can tune in, you could listen. I believe it is free to listen as well. So go ahead and get your tickets down below. You do need to register if you want it to be free up front because then I believe it's charged later. Yes. Lots of details that I'm unaware of, but go down to the link in the description box and get your tickets there. I do know you can do that much, and I know you'll be encouraged there as well. Okay, let's dive in. The Now That We're a Family Podcast. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. I, you know, I don't think we said this before, but I, I don't, I don't think I'm exaggerating when when I say that I think you are the most requested interview in our for our podcast over the last two years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so it's really fun for us to be able to sit down with you. And I know there's a bunch of questions I have. There's a bunch of questions Katie has. Uh, but for our listeners, for anybody that maybe doesn't know who you are, uh, or maybe for old friends that haven't seen you in a while, you know, what's your life like right now? Who's who's Rachel Jankovic right now, 2024? I'm, I'm doing the same thing I've been doing for a long time. So I am still primarily homemaker, wife, mother at home. That's That's what I do all the time. I sometimes write occasionally. And, but mostly I'm just trying, you know, feeding 10 people three times a day is a lot of feeding people. That's like, that's my, this is my job. (laughs) I'm trying to keep people fed doing the work at home. Uh, I have written a couple of books and I do podcasts with my sister, but those are things that fit in, in the, around other things all the time. Well, actually to that really quick, could you give us a rundown? Cause you said you feed 10 people every day. So, um, you're married, you have, how many children do you have? Like what's the age range? Eight wow. kids. So we have our oldest is 19 uh, down to a one-year-old. So we have a, a big uh, eight-year gap, seven-year gap between our second youngest and our youngest. So so just telling your wife, he's the dot on our exclamation point, that that baby, the oh, <laughs> surprise. <nice. laughs> Super ah. fun though. And I think people don't talk enough about how great it is to have both teenagers. I have five teenagers right now, but having teenagers and a baby is like, pretty great. It's living the, it's the parenting splits in a big way, but it is still really, really sweet and fun. Wow. Yeah. What, what a wild ride there. And I'm curious too, when it comes to motherhood, hospitality, you do some big hospitality outreach things and they kind of blow. We have a lot of people. 
<laughs> yeah, it blows my mind. I love it how you guys center so much around food and just the community and the fellowship and the discipleship that happens there. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. You also mentioned, you know, you wrote your book, Loving the Little Years, when your kids were still pretty little. And so you've been involved in these outreaches of, you know, podcasting or writing or hospitality your whole motherhood life. And so I'm curious, how have you balanced that? Clearly your family is your priority, um, but how have you balanced that? Because you've had a lot of impact over this time period outside your home as well. Well, it has been, so I've been a mother for 19 years. Our first four kids were very, very close together. So we were young when we, you know, young renting, we were in a small apartment when we had four kids, three and under. So because we had our first two 18 months apart and then twins 18 months later, it was like fast and furious into our oldest barely turned three. And when we had four kids, so we almost had four, two and under, which would have been really wow, but we, we didn't make that cut off. <laughs> um, but at that phase, uh, we jokingly, it was kind of parenting boot camp. It was like, welcome to the real world. <laughs> like, there's so much you don't know that you need to find out right now. Uh, but at that time, we were not. We've always, my husband and I both love food. I would, we would have people over sometimes, but it was not at all a time where we had extra bandwidth to be hosting big crowds all the time or that. So I would say in the 20 years, 19 years that I've been a mother, it's been very different phases of what was possible, what made sense as a natural overflow of the way we were living. And, um, but I would never tell someone who has their house full of babies, you should be having 40 people over every Saturday, you know, um, don't, I would never say you should do that at that time. My mom was hosting what we do a Sabbath dinner every Saturday night. And my mom was hosting at that time. So I made things to take to it. You know, like I did that work. Um, and I, so I've been involved in it for a long time, but I wasn't hosting it primarily. We didn't even have people over very often. Like sometimes I think we would be hosting, you know, a Bible study or something, but it was a major exertion to do that. Like when we did, it was like, I might die. Like this is, this is, this is asking too much of us to have dinner cleaned up and the bathroom clean and the kids ready to, it was like, we can't, we can't do this all. Um, so I would say there were just times where my priority being at home meant we weren't being super hospitable. We were always involved in the work of becoming hospitable, but like involved in learning how to do things. Um, and I would say whenever you're talking about hospitality, show hospitality to your own family. First, these are your closest neighbors, you know? So in that phase, it really was maxing out my, my capacity to care for the people that were in my home and to make dinner every night and do what needed to be done there. So if you fast forward, we typically have people over Saturday nights. We're in a much different, bigger house. Now I have, as I said, five teenagers, they help and handle so much of it. They do so much of the work and um, that it wouldn't have been possible in another phase for us to do that either. Like they really do make it possible. So I guess I would say we've done all kinds of different things through the years and, and just hopefully overlapping our capacity, our abilities, what God's given us with what we see as a biblical approach to being open-handed, generous, uh, glad to have people share it with you. Well, I love how you pointed out, okay, this is over 19 years. And this is one of the biggest things I have appreciated from your ministry and your parents' ministry is just the long-term vision with it. I think so often we get caught up into like, well, I need to do everything right now instead of like, how do I build over time and how do I move towards uh, what God has for me just the best I can in this season and continue growing my capabilities. And um, yeah, instead of just putting that pressure on ourselves, we'll be like, well, it's now or nothing. You know, yeah, well, even how you said in those years where maybe you weren't opening up your home or having a lot of people into it, you were growing in your capacity to one day do that. I forget how you worded it, but yeah. you're like, maybe you weren't actively being hospitable, but you were growing in your ability to one day, one day be hospitable. And I think that's something that, again, we can all take because as you said, that season of life, that's pretty extreme, honestly, you know, four kids, three and under. So it's not like every family is going to find themselves in that season. Yeah, uh, but I think people can relate to feel, to maybe some similar seasons, just having young children. 
and and you feel like your bandwidth is totally maxed and you're like what i'm supposed to find a family at church and have them over you know twice a week for whatever you know and it becomes obligatory in an inappropriate manner so i really appreciate you sharing the context there that's really helpful Okay, so I have a question. You've got some older girls, and this is a question that comes up a lot from our audience, and I, I'm genuinely curious about it too. How do you encourage your girls to value? I actually wrote this down because I wanted to. Okay, how do you prioritize education while still elevating motherhood and not getting hung up in career? Because I think we kind of can fall on either side of the ditch on this, and so I'm just kind of curious how you're encouraging your your young women. Okay. So we do really value and prioritize education. Now a big, I, and I also do value and prioritize the domestic arts, learning how to do things, but I actually think those things are in no way in combat with each other because your education equips you to be competent and capable at these other things. At um, So I think sometimes people think of the domestic arts as being kind of like a craft kit or something. Like, can you do this thing that requires zero skill, zero talent? Um, and, and in the course of my, like I have met girls from family. So back in the nineties, you know, the, there was a real, I would say it was legalistic, but a very, there was kind of a thing of women don't need to be educated because they're going to just be at home taking care of the kids. Um, and I met a woman, met some girls at that time, back at, back when I was in high school and they were not being educated well, right? And their reason was because they were just going to do domestic things. Um, and my sister and I were trying to, it was like we were trying to befriend it was a very, it was a very, we didn't actually mix well. It was not, it was one of those times where you're really, it's a lot of work trying to befriend people. But one of the things that came, became very evident is that they didn't actually, like not educating your daughters is undercutting how they'll be able, like we were trying to find common ground, something to do together. Like, why don't we make a quilt? But they couldn't do the math to figure out how much fabric you would need to make a quilt. They couldn't do that. You know, like they didn't have any of the tools to engage with learning how to bake bread instead of just following one recipe that someone taught you. They didn't know how to like think about things, the scientific process, the, but like how, if you think about how much in your life, you're like, well, my hypothesis is that if I do this recipe this way, it will. And you're like, I was wrong. <laughs> my hypothesis was proved wrong. Um, I guess I would just say that I don't see them at being at all at odds with each other. Like, I think the more educated your daughters are, the, the more capable they will be at taking on the domestic arts, at seeing the value in things and recognizing the um, philosophy, undergirding things that are cultural trends. And you end up just having what I would call dangerous in a good way, dangerous women, the kind of women who just can do things that will make a big impact. And, um, and that's obviously our goal, but I think that you could mess that up by saying, girls, we have you in school because we want you to be a lawyer. What we value above everything is your debate skills or, you know, you could be weird there uh, or not giving them any imaginative vision for what a woman really serving the Lord in the domestic sphere is like, what that can be like and how interesting and uh, fulfilling, I would say that that actually is. So I don't, I don't see it as being something that we've, we haven't struggled with that at all with our four teenage daughters. There's been no struggle with, but wait, you know, we don't want this for you. So I don't know how to, I don't really know how to, I guess I would say if you have a good approach to education and a good approach to the domestic arts, they actually just are friends. They get along well. <laughs> they just, it's not a problem. Yeah. You're ultimately painting this big picture for what vibrant womanhood can be and being like, Hey, the more educated and equipped and capable you are, the more you can live into this more fully and more okay. capably. And so these things all work well together. I think probably where the education can go off or where, what people might point to is like, well, look, they placed this high value on education and now she doesn't want to have kids or get married or stay at home. But I think that had so much more to do with what the parents were valuing and what the parents were emulating in their own home um yeah, than and, the education being the issue yeah and probably the particular education system that they were a part of whether that being yeah. a public school or a liberal uh college environment that was not conducive to their 
worldview at all. You know, I love how you said you've given casting a vision for really kind of like the glorious nature that can be uh, motherhood, that can be really parenting. And this goes for, hus- you know, fathers and mothers. It does seem like by undervaluing just the, the sanctity of the home, the value of the home, you therefore undervalue the roles in the home. And you're kind of like, okay, well, why, why would I, and, and that's a societal thing, obviously. It's like CEO is the thing we're encouraged to strive for, where father and mother are just kind of like, well, it happens. Like it kind of happens to everybody. You become that rather than seeing it for the, right. the divine role that, that it is and, and how the home as an institution is far more influential than any outside organization that you could someday maybe, you know, be the head of. How do you do that then? Because I, I know that this, again, it's biblical literacy. It's, uh, you know, generational faithfulness. How has that been passed on in a practical way? Because kids are also kids and they want to do fun things. They, they, they see the metrics of the world, so to speak, the scoreboard of the world. And that is motivating. Is there a way to kind of like articulate, even using the language, you know, the domestic arts, a language around showing the value of the home and and how has that happened in your upbringing and then how you're bringing your children up where you're saying, yeah, like there is this metric system out there. We're playing by a different set of rules here. Man, I think that's a a really complex question, but I think a huge part of it is this is something I say in other contexts, but you know how if you laugh at something, if you're looking at your phone and you laugh at something, what do your kids do? They all want to come see yeah. everyone's like, what is it? What is it? What are you looking at? Or what delights you? They want to see the thing that delighted you. Like, you know, like you're like, oh my goodness. Or say you're driving and you're like, oh my word, everybody looks like, what is it? What is it? What are we looking at? Um, That is a natural human thing. That is, it is natural. But one of the things that does not happen, it doesn't happen in reverse. If you are scolding your kids and you want them all to look at the mess that they made, they don't look at the mess. You're like, look at it. And everybody just looks at you <laughs> like, and you're like, no, look at what you did. And they just are watching you have a bad attitude. That's it. That's all they can see is mom is losing it. Mom doesn't know. And, and they're like, there's nothing to see over there. Uh, but your joy is very compelling. Like if you're delighted by something or you see something beautiful, everybody wants to see what you see. They want to turn and look at what you look at. And when mothers, I'm parents, when, when they are grumpily doing their duty, they do not, they are not giving a good testimony to what kind of joy it is to follow the Lord. Like what kind of joy is it? And so one of the things that I love, and this is not, um, I would just say one of my favorite things, we live up on a hill, we have beautiful views up here. So when I hear one of my kids yelling, everybody look at the mountain, because it's like a sunset, something beautiful is happening. It's like, alert, we all need to go see what's cool here. That kind of thing is a natural, like it's, it's wonderful and healthy, but it also gets there imaginative vision of like, I'm del- I like to learn to make food. I like to, we're pushing into things that I've never done before. I've been cooking for a long time, but you're like, oh, this is the thread that I'm pursuing right now. They're all interested in it. They're interested in how's it going? What's happening here? What are we doing? Um, and your joy in, in following God, your joy in pursuing things and your joy in sharing that with your children is very contagious. They love to come do the same thing back. Like, look at what I just saw. This is so cool. Or look what I learned how to do, or look what this. Um, so it's not like I'm pushing them around. You know, my daughters love to read cookbooks. And it's really funny because back when I was younger, I used to read cookbooks. So I would like buy a new cookbook to be like, I'm going to read this whole thing. And then I can never find it because the girls took it away. They read it. They're, they're all like, the, I'll give you the notes, mom. I'll tell you what I found out. What I marked the things we should make from this at cookbook. But that wasn't because I'm trying, because I'm saying, girls, you have to be interested in being a good cook. Like, and now I want to compel you wanting to do something that I have not made interesting or attractive in any way to you. You know, like I haven't, I haven't enjoyed this myself. I ha- and it's like, who would want to do that? You know, like, but when you're inviting them into 
an interesting life that is full of joy and something that we share together and we fellowship about. It's it's very compelling and it's very natural. It's like the way God made these sorts of things to be handed off. You know, like they just do value it. And it's not because we have it on the dry erase board that this week you're going to learn to value good enchiladas or whatever it is. It's, like <laughs> it's not showing up on the board. <laughs> we're just this is kind of what we, how we live together. Um, and so I would say, I always want to go back to the fact that your own obedience in where God has put you, what jobs he has given you is the thing that compels your children. They see the beauty, the joy of the Lord living in that. And they want that. They don't want something else. So I, I guess I would say you have to be it yourself and your kids will outpace you very quickly. My, I mean, I think it's hilarious having four teenage daughters right now. And I think of myself as kind of knowing my way around the kid. I've done this a lot, but it's hilarious when you have a teenage daughter who's like, this is my pie crust. And, and everyone agrees it's better than mine. I'm like, she's better than I am. We all, <laughs> we all, I was like, you'll have to teach me how you did that. <laughs> like, you're going to have to show me out. Um, and it, but it's, a, that's a really fun, that's a fun thing to have happen. So, oh, that's so fun that you have older girls. And we've had a lot of guests on the podcast who have older sons, but not a lot of moms who have th that older daughter relationship. And I'm curious because you have a good relationship with your mom too. How did, how do you feel like your mom cultivated relationship with you? Do you feel like that's just been totally natural to cultivate with your daughters and you've kind of done it without thinking? Or have there been some things that you've been really intentional with where you're like, I am going to institute, you know, these kinds of principles to help this relationship? Um, no, I mean, yes and no. Sure, there have been times where we're like, okay, uh, especially I would say going into the teen years, there are things that I've had to very consciously change about my instinctive ways that I would want to parent, but not because it has been tumultuous. It's been a very smooth and fun relationship with them, but more just wanting to make sure that I'm not, um, like a good example of that this last summer when I ha here I am with five teenagers last summer at home. And I was like, this is, this is a lot of teenagers. <laughs> like this is a lot. And one of the things that my husband and I talked about is like, I just practiced for the summer, not telling them to do anything. Like I'm not telling them to do anything. I will ask them, what are your, what's your plans? What are you planning to get done today? You know, like instead of, and this was primarily because with the more kids that you have and the more responsibilities that I have, the, e the easier it would be for me to use a bunch of full-time employees. The easier it would be to be like, I'm glad to see you this morning. This is the work I have for you. This is what you have to do. Um, but it's such an important time in their own life, where you see them needing to develop what things they care about that would never have made it on a list in my mind, you know, like that is them cultivating their own interests and the things that they want to learn how to do. And like that without my input, they're making lists of things that they want, like books that they wanted to get read and things that they're, and, and needing to give them the space for that and wanting them to still be helping at home. Like, so we would talk more about things like, Instead of specific times, we would talk about wanting them to be intuitive. Like I could unload the dishwasher right now. I could do this because I saw it, but not because mom saw me and told me to, but because I'm looking around me <laughs> and trying to be helpful. Um, but that's the thing that was a very conscious and effortful decision. And I can tell you that deciding you're going to not tell any of your five most capable people to do anything really reveals to you how much you would like to tell them all <laughs> to do yeah. things for you. Yeah, <laughs> You're like, being a challenge. turns out I always have something I would like to tell you to do for me. And it's really good discipline for me to just zip it. And then, and also those younger kids need the, uh, they need to be the person that you're saying, Hey, take this garbage out just because they're not the tallest and strongest but they actually need to still be the person that you're like, you guys. So in the summer, it was very funny. We were just like, these are the people I tell to do things. You're the people that just need to do what looks useful <laughs> when, when you see it. Um, and that that's very deliberate. And it certainly is something that, that was good for my relationship with them all to, to give them that space. Um, but I wouldn't say, I would say for the most part, it has been a natural 
relationship and a friendly relationship. And I think that there is something to the expectation of drama that some people have with teenagers um, that you like make allowances like this is going to be this is going to be the years where we're going to be all mad at each other <laughs> like there's no reason there's no reason to pencil that in like just stay in fellowship and and work on it and um, and there's no reason to have tumultuous i mean i've said i have five teenagers right now and it's really fun and delightful it's not a conflict rich environment it's a it's a good time so Wow. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there were so many good insights there. Just going back to you talking about almost having this like instinctual uh, reaction to like, you know, uh, I guess d use them as employees. You're like, oh, I've got all this talent and all these capabilities you and all these for years. Yeah. All these projects, you know, around the house. And yet it's when you said that I thought back to so many um, families that I grew up with because we, we grew up in conservative homeschool communities. And I do think a lot of the the young boys and and the young ladies when they they became like the second mom or the second the second father they and then all of a sudden they were a 13 year old and it's like okay now they're in charge of babysitting all the time and cleaning and doing the meals and then they grew up with a resentful attitude towards the domestic arts you know as as you would put it and so i think it's really cool to hear how you were being intentional and in not having that be the case be like well, wait a second they need to discover you're, you're exemplifying that these things are valuable but then you're not burdening them with things that you're like, no, this, these are my responsibilities. This is my home. But in, and, and you want to encourage them to be helpful. So I just think that's really good insight. It's yeah. been and one of the things that's great about that is giving them the room to pursue. I have to realize that I'm much older than they are. I've already wasted a lot of time in my life having to learn things the hard way. Like I, you know, I see one of my teen daughters spent you know, whatever, a whole day doodling a cute schedule for herself, you know, and everything in me wants to be like, this is not the same thing as doing it. You know, like you're writing it down, you're making it look cute, but you have to. But the funny thing is, is that it, I could tell her that and she could say, oh, OK, do you not want me to do this? You know, but like the reality is it takes time to try something that you thought was going to work for yourself and then realize that didn't make me get any of that done. <laughs> like I did this, but it turned out to not actually be doing the thing and just giving them the time to figure those things out um, and not be expecting them to have the intuition of a 40 year old when they are <laughs> 14, you know, they're not, they're, they're actually not going to have it. And, but it's been really sweet and humbling to see when you just give them the room what are the sorts of things that they actually did have on their mind that they wanted to do? And it is humbling because, you know, like I, my teenage son, what's he doing? Te trying to teach himself biblical Greek by reading his Greek New Testament alongside, like making notes, doing stuff. And I'm like, I never would have said, here's the thing we need to do today. You know, like, I want you to hustle up to your room and get out those post-it notes and try to figure out what Greek words mean. I mean, like, I would never say that, but how good was it? How much is it forming what kind of a person he is and what he's interested in? And it's just good for mom to get out of there and let them have that space. Yeah, I'm going to need to like, listen, replay that back, you know, probably every year. Because it's so easy to just step in and be like, I know the best thing to do in this situation. I'll save you the time. Instead of just being like, you know, some things they do need to figure out on their own. And I'm curious when it comes to, did you have, because obviously the Wilson family has achieved a level of notoriety just across the board, but like specifically in the Christian community, right? And then you have, um, so was that there when you were growing up? compared to your kids growing up and kind of what have your thoughts been with that when you're raising your kids in this environment where they're, you know, Doug and Nancy's grandkids or, you know, Rachel's kids. And yeah, what have your thoughts been around that? There was some of that when I was growing up, but very, um, it was, was not troublesome at all. We were, so my dad has never been a pastoral oversharer. He's not like, like, so when people knew of us, they maybe knew a thing that, you know, a story that he'd told in a sermon that was in no way embarrassing or like, it was not an overshare about my life. It was not like, I can't believe a stranger 
knows that, <laughs> but that's uncomfortable. And um, there were some ways that I suppose we were sort of mostly when the ACCS started and there would be an ACCS. Um, I, this actually is hilarious. I think of my parents having nerves of steel, but I can remember people coming here. Like there was one family that came and they're like, we just want to take your kids out. We were teenagers and ask them what it's really like, whatever. And my parents are like, sure. <laughs> like, and I think that's hilarious. Like I can't imagine, I can't, who knows? I mean, that's just funny in retrospect, but there was not a lot of, um, I would say my parents have never pursued their public presence. Like it was a fame opportunity at all. So there was no feelings of that being a pastor's kids and um, locally you are more in a heavily observed. I don't, that was not because of dad's writing around in other places, but when you're a pastor's kids, people are, we'll see what you're doing, but I don't think that that kind of accountability was in any way negative for us. We knew from the time we were very young that if any of us were misbehaving in some significant way, dad would step down. Like we knew we were his qualifications to being a pastor. And that was not a weird weight put on us. It was just a, it was just something that we knew, you know, we, it was like, there were consequences to this, but my parents were just, I would say that was not weird at all. It, I mean, I realize it's all I've ever known, but it was never weird. It just seemed normal. And um, with my own children and with having like, I have an Instagram account, which I sell them post on, yeah, <laughs> but, but you're hard to get and, a hold of on. And in the podcast or, you know, whatever. I do have things like one thing I will never do is like tours of our home. I never want my kids to meet people who already know what their bedroom looks like. Like how weird is that? Like that's, and so I'm not afraid of my kids, of, people seeing a picture of our whole family or of kind of figuring out who, which of your kids is this one. Um, but I don't want their personal life public in a way that they would ever resent. But I also never want them to look at things that I've posted and think that's not accurate of what our life was actually like. So I would say I have a lot of there. That's an interesting thing with social media. I feel like I'm a little too old to actually be as impacted by social media as uh, like, I'm like, I'm somehow on some generational border somehow where I'm just instinctively not interested in that. But when, but you can see how you could very easily get up and think this would post well, right? This is a thing. So like, there's a lot of things I do in my house that if I was sharing pictures of it, I know it would get a lot of attention. I know people would love to talk about it. People would love to make it a, a thing. And yet it really matters to me that my kids know I'm doing this because I actually think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Not that I'm doing this because it it'll get likes. Like, or you know how I, I'm like making quilts right now. And I'm like, you know, could you be posting this constantly? But then would you be making the quilt for your children or for the internet? Like, who are you really doing this for? <laughs> like, what's it? Or or even the like, we want to see your room. I don't want to get, I mean, we want to see your, you know, people are like, I want to see your systems because you have a lot of kids. And, and the temptation that would be there that, I mean, I am not inclined to it, but you can see how, if you were like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Well, then the temptation is like, let me get this kid's room all in order so that I can show it to the internet. And I would never want my kids to be <laughs> thinking, but that's not what our house was actually like. This was just what it was like, you know, like this doesn't, this doesn't sound like my life. So I, I would say that I do prioritize that even though in some ways I'm a public figure. I'm I'm mostly not at all a public figure. Like most of my life, I don't, I'm at home all day trying to get stuff done, barely getting out of the house sometimes. And my kids know that, like that is the mom that they know. That's the life that they know. And, and I don't, so I guess I would say they don't feel any, they think it's funny when we have a conference here and someone will be like, are you two the twins? And it's not my twins. <laughs> They're like, they know there's twins in here somewhere. <laughs> they, they don't know who it is, you know? So I, they're not, it's not a big deal in their life is what I would say. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, 
definitely what we hope that our kids say one day about us. And that's just, you have to be so cautious to put those guardrails up. And I'm curious too, you know, you mentioned social media. How have you navigated that with your high schoolers, your teenagers? Um, my oldest is on social media, but I think she has posted maybe one time that she was proud of her sister who won state at track. <laughs> like it, I think that's the extent. Um, because they do see that we believe social media is a tool. Like this is a tool and it should be used faithfully, but there, there are a lot of temptations involved with it. They really just are not interested in. So we're not holding them all back. Our oldest daughter got it, got Facebook or Instagram, whatever, when she went into college, but it was so that she could be connected to a few groups or things that she needed to be connected to. But otherwise they're not, they are not interested in it. So they are not doing it. Um, they have, yeah. So we haven't, I guess from that perspective, you could say we're really not navigating it, but we would not let them have social media probably before they're 18. Anyways, I'm like, it really is a brain formation issue. And I would say something that I have seen and in the good old days, when we were all growing up, you can imagine a mom taking her teenage daughter out shopping and the teenage daughter surprising her with like, I just think this is so cute. And it's an immodest outfit of some kind. And the mom being like, no way, you know, like I will not buy that for you. And them having a great rip roaring fight about it. Right. Or maybe a dad being involved in over my dead body. Will you dress like this? You know, whatever. Uh, but at least in that, and I, and I'm not saying that that's a good time that that would be happening, <laughs> but at least then the parents knew what they were fighting about. They, they saw the thing that got their daughter's attention. They'd be like, I don't want you to look like this. I don't want you pursuing this. And so there would be a big butting of heads, but it was over something that everyone knew what we were talking about. You know, we see it. It's right here for many parents. They are basically funding a imaginary shopping trip where their daughters are having their imaginations captured by who knows what, right? And they never even, it never came back to be the thing to talk about with your parents, right? It never came back to be like, I would really like to have six inch nails. I mean, the and if it did come back, the parents might be like, <laughs> what? <laughs> why would you, why would you want that? What are you thinking? Uh, but it just isn't coming to the surface to be something to even talk about. So I would say there's so many, uh, dangers, but a big part of the danger is just that parents don't even know what it is that their children think is beautiful, interesting, what kind of person they would like to be, you know, like, what is it that I, would like to be like they it's like something that's happening on their dime but out of sight like parents have no clue what's happening so i would just say there's a lot of a lot of reason to be really hesitant with that and i would well i would say more than hesitant just like no way <laughs> we're not we're not doing this um but it hasn't for us that's not been an issue because we have not, we have not had teenagers desperate for it at all. They're not interested in it. So, well, I like how you paint it as this tool. So it's like, okay, well, what are you going to use it for? How are you going to be driving things forward? And if you aren't, it's, it's painted in a totally different light than like, this is just a good time to hang out and just wander around aimlessly. Like, I think that's what kids think when they get it. It's just like, oh, I'm just going to sit down and just wander. And it's like, no, okay, do you want to handle this responsibility? Are you going to use it for something? And then it just becomes a lot less appealing unless you have a very clear vision for what you're using the, the media. Totally. For. And one thing my husband and I have explained to our kids anyways, is just like, the internet looks like a fun time. Like you're thinking, oh, it's full of full of cute things to shop for and funny things to laugh at. And it looks like a good time. It's like, it's kind of like going to an amusement park. It, you know, the music and the lights and everything's happening. I was like, but you just have to realize that there are a lot of very nasty people in all the dark corners that would like to grab you. Well, you think you're just had a fun time. <laughs> you're just having a fun time, but you could very easily get abducted from this location. Um, and just it, explaining to them that neither 
myself or my husband that were like, we're just more experienced to recognize at a further distance what we would never look at. Like, you know, because it's not as though we don't need to be careful, right? It's that both of us, there's all kinds of things that I'm like, oh, you go to search for something on Instagram. You're like, <laughs> like don't, oh, yeah. please, whatever these suggestions are, like, whoa, this is not what I, I'm like, you know, um, but my husband and I both, there's all kinds of precautions that you would, you you don't go just wandering around on the internet because, but because as we've explained to our kids, we don't think we're safe there. We don't think this is where any Christian should be. It's just, you know, you want to get in and out very safely. <laughs> like, what are yeah. you trying to do? Um, but I do think many Christian parents act like they are mature enough to handle whatever is like, as though maturity gets you to a place where you don't need to be wise, always careful. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the thing is, is that we're older. We're not interested in those. We're not interested in getting off in the dark alleys, um, which is not the same thing as being immune to it. You're like, we just know how to recognize further away that that's what that is, you know? Yeah. Well, even backing up, I love how you talked about the missed opportunities that you have. You know, you talked about the scenario of a teenage daughter, you know, working through an argument with her mother or father, and you know what the thing it what the thing is that you're arguing about. And it's funny when you said that I think back to my teenage years and when we when my parents would say, No, you can't go to that event or no, we don't want you in that environment, or you can't watch that, or you can't listen. Like we knew what the discussion was about. And and so therefore there would always be a takeaway. It's like you got to hear your parents' heart. You got to hear the philosophy behind it. There was a foundation to it. And you're totally stripping that uh, that that opportunity for growth when you are just in the privacy of your own little world, your own little phone. Uh, and that's really devastating. When you said that, I was like, man, that's nuts. I hadn't considered it from that perspective of the missed opportunities that you have as a parent to walk with your children through these outside scenarios that, you know, maybe is how I was brought up. Yeah. Yeah. Even when you, even when you're just saying, this is not the way I want you to be, you're having a discussion about something that that is present in the real world instead of your child living in a world that you don't even see what they're thinking about, what they're doing. It may feel like less conflict for some parents. They feel like there's less, you know, we'll just let them do that. But in the long term, I think it's just infinitely more conflict. Yeah. And I, okay. So I just saw an interview with you and your dad and a couple of your siblings. It was a while ago. I think it was in November, but it was just a blast. You guys clearly have a lot of joy in your relationships. And I love that. How did your parents promote those sibling relationships with you and your sister and Indy? And like, yeah, you guys like are best friends as adults. Was it always that way? Was it not? I think we were always, we're two years we're so like my sister and I are four years apart. So growing up, we were very seldom in the same circle, you know, like that's a significant difference when you're growing up. Um, and I remember she was more, she like, she, I remember more times that Nate and I would be like, come on, come do this with us. And she's like, just one more chapter. I'm just going to read one more chapter. Um, so my sister and I were really in different worlds. Most, we always got along fine aside from normal normal sides of sibling conflict that no doubt we had plenty of. Um, but we got along fine, but we really were not that close of friends until we were, um, both married and in the suddenly in the same phase of life, the same kind of like, now we're doing the same thing. There's a lot more camaraderie. Um, but we always, I, we were always as a family, I would say we were always in fellowship with each other. And we dinner table was a time of always lots and lots of talking and arguing and talking and, you know, um, but I would say one of the biggest things that my parents did that we have wanted to do as well has just been not demanding anything of your children. Like, especially when you have a lot of kids, they drift into closer sibling relationships with different kids at different times when they have overlapping interest. When like two of them are like, we're really into this friendship bracelets or something right now. So we are always the ones talking to each other or being like, let's do this. Or, uh, you know, the, the boys that like to play baseball together or the, you know, the, and then it's just like, oh, when that phase is over, they drifted into a friendship with a different one. Um, 
And I would just say, we really have primarily not wanted to demand anything of anyone. And my parents did not do that either. Their expectations for, we did not grow up with them saying, when you're grown up, you're going to be best friends. This is how it's going to be. This is what you have to live up to. It is what happened. And I think surprised us all. Like, I think all of us were like, how nice is this? This is a great time. Um, but neither of my parents are super close with their siblings. You know, like we had, they came from families where they didn't have that, really didn't have that experience. And I don't think they expected it of us. And I remember being, I don't think I thought that when Becca and I were both married, and really it was just the absence of thinking about it probably is what it was. But we didn't grow up with this expectation of how the relationship will be. Um, and that is the thing that I think is really important to not put that kind of thing on your children. Like this is your, be- you know, you guys have to be the best friends ever. It's like, no, we all have to love each other. We all have to stay in fellowship, but we're not demanding certain kinds of relationships from you. And um, that freedom is, is very, it's, it's a, my parents were always that way, like about Christmas or whatever. Don't worry about if you want to do your own thing you know, like, like feel free to do your own thing. And we're all like, what we're coming like this. You can't kick us out of Christmas. Um, and, and I think that being open-handed like that is such a gift to your kids that there's no strings attached all the time. And it's okay. If somebody wants to do something by themselves or, you know, doesn't want to play with a sibling right now or whatever. So, um, But I would say as much as that is like, don't demand it. I do think it's what builds great relationships. So our kids really prefer to come home and hang out together. They like to be together more than they want to go do other things. So, yeah, as you're talking about this, I think a lot of a hospitality episode that you did where you were saying, pull, don't push. And it's kind of like that being proactive with your guests and kind of drawing them into something, even how you're talking about earlier on this episode, having that joy. So you're drawing your children to the joy instead of shoving them where you want to go. And I just think it sounds like that's what happened with your family relationships. You weren't saying this is the way it is. You will like these people because you're blood. It was like, no, there was just joy there. You know, your, your parents aren't forcing you to come to Christmas. It's just, that's where you want to be. You want to be there because people are not being demanding and there's not a lot of strings attached. It's a delightful place to be. Yeah. And isn't that ironic that the tighter we pull people, the more they just want to get away and have their own room to breathe. <laughs> But the problem is pulling, but not pushing is hugely effective in all leadership. But as you can easily foresee, pulling is more exhausting than pushing. Pushing can be done from the couch where you just try to boss everyone around. It doesn't work, but you feel like you're really getting stuff done. Pulling requires you to be way more engaged. So like an example of that would be our kids do the dishes together. That's a thing that they do. But helping them having good relationships in doing that a lot of the time is turning on the music and doing it yourself with them like being like this is the way we're going to do it it's a lot more energy than sitting around being like you're not being helpful you're being like <laughs> that that but that that would be pushing instead of pulling but that pulling is always inviting people to come with you and i think it really is the role of parents and um, and a lot of parents would prefer it to not require quite so much of so much of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we we so relate to that. It's like when you get up and you do something with your kiddos, the energy compounds so rapidly versus just, yeah, commanding them to go do something oftentimes. I want to I want to be sensitive to your time. I, I know you've got a couple questions you want oh, to yeah, ask. Oh, no, yeah, no, I mean. I, are I you able to share quickly kind of uh, about your Bible reading plan? Because we actually get asked a lot about how to start studying the Bible. How is your Bible reading plan different? Because it's so funny. I've, I've heard from so many different people that find value out of your Bible reading plan, and they come from like they all come from like such different theological camps. And realizing like, oh, this is like a very practical how to read your Bible. It's not like it's, this isn't, you're not teaching people what the Bible says. Yeah. You are almost like facilitating yeah. them reading the Bible. So could you share, share to that? Sure. This ties in a lot with what we were talking about, social media being a tool anyways. And um, the Bible reading challenge was born out of, we had a, the Grace Agenda conference was on the 500 years of since the Reformation, um, 2017. And that was the 
um, year that the Bible reading challenge was born, but it happened because we were talking about all these women of the reformation. And I said something very reckless in the Q and a that bothered me immediately. So someone asked something and I said it and I was like, I believe that, but wow, I don't like what I just said, <laughs> which was, we were talking about these women like Katie Luther and these real powerhouse of amazing women during the reformation. Um, and I made the comment that they weren't superhuman. They were just faithful Christian women being faithful in the moment that they that God put them in. And I was saying, so we could hope that they would look at our lives and say, I can't believe how much they got done. You know, that those women could see what we were, where we are and think, wow, what an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, you say that out loud and you're like, I, be I believe it, but we're not really, we're not really getting anything near what they were getting done, done. Now in that whole discussion afterwards, we were, I mean, following that we were just talking about things we wanted to do with the women in our own church and how we wanted to equip them to be getting their own encouragement. Not like we don't want to be throwing events to help them with this, but they all have access to God's word. And, and we know it equips his people. And so what if we used, so like social media, what if we basically used all the stupid tools we could get our hands on to just encourage people to open their own Bible, like get into your own Bible and open that up and read it. And um, because God's word really is what changes us and what equips us. And we don't have an agenda. So we would say, we're not trying to teach the Bible. We're trying to teach a love of the Bible. We're trying to teach a hunger for God's word. Um, and there's, it turns out specifically, I'm not trying to teach um, me specifically. The Bible reading challenge is very co-ed. I am only talking to women about it primarily. So uh, that's why, I, that's why I keep using feminine examples, but it's, but it's accurate for men too. And um, that there, the enemy just has no trouble at all keeping us from the word, you know, the kinds of things that we have allowed to be obstacles, like I messed up, you know, I started on January 1st and I, I ran into dry ground in Deuteronomy. So now we're going to have to wait until next January, like, or it has to be a Monday or a new plan or a new, you know, whatever. Um, or I don't understand this. It's not doing anything for me. You know, like I, I read something, I don't get it. And um, thinking you have to journal a ton and make a ton of personal applications rather than just faithfully coming to God's word. So we did a lot of, I did a lot of work and discussion and encouragement around just what are the obstacles keeping you from the word. But the actual plan, uh, what makes it unique is that it is, we do the New Testament in the summer and that's called same page summer. And then the academic year is um, the to the word Bible reading challenge. And that is the whole Bible. So it's the whole Bible in nine months and then the New Testament again in the summer. So uh, anytime that you jump in with us, a year later, you should have read the New Testament twice and the Old Testament once. And um, what we really encourage people to do is treat it like it's it's the menu. that The reading of the day is what's on the menu. If you get behind, jump back in on the day that we're currently reading. Don't, don't be like, I have to catch up. I have to do this right. The whole thing, just, just keep coming back. And for many people... Uh, that practice of jumping back in is, is a really big deal. It's a big deal to be like, I didn't read the first four chapters of this Bible of this, but I'm going to jump in. Um, but overcoming that perfectionism does a lot to get you in the word repeatedly and not having stupid guilt trips about it. So uh, the actual program is not connected to specific teaching. It's not connected to like and um, the Bible reading challenge women's Facebook group is enormous. And we have people from all we, we say theologically diverse, literally on the same page. Like we're just, we're just reading the same pages of the <laughs> Bible, so good. but, but we're not actually saying we all have to believe the same things about what's being taught here. And a huge part of that for me is just that we actually trust the Holy spirit. We trust God in his word to be teaching people instead of us having to be like applying it to everyone. Like it is the Holy spirit that meets his people in his word. And so if I can get somebody that I don't agree with at all to just read their Bible, I feel like, yay. <laughs> like that's, I don't need to be here to be like, 
I'm going to apply this to your weird view of whatever. It's like, just, I'm delighted. If you're just reading your Bible, that's excellent. <laughs> that's great. The Lord will take care of the rest. So as we're closing here, can you tell, tell people where they can find more resources that you have out there? You mentioned, you know, the Bible reading Facebook group. We want to list, I said that wrong, but we want to list anything that you have resource wise. Um, where can people find that? Uh, to the word.com is we'll have all the links to anything that you could need with the Bible reading challenge. That is there. Um, there's printable plans. There's a Facebook group. There are apps that have the plan on it. So whatever app you prefer to use, you can probably do it on there. Hopefully. Um, that's where you can find all the Bible reading stuff. Otherwise, most of my stuff is probably on Amazon or with Canon. Um, but I don't, I don't manage any of that. I don't, I don't do any of my own book promo or I'm like, I, I'm, I think I have a copy of all of my books at my house, but I might not. <laughs> um, so just, I would say Canon press has most of like the Canon app probably has, um, the audio versions of most of my books and then you can buy them from them or from Amazon. Uh, and then my sister and I do podcast, try to do that regularly. It's called what have you. Um, but we're not very regular at it right now but as best we can fit it in when Ezra's napping, we do. I love that. I just love the joy that you have and the joy of the Lord. It, it really radiates for you, Rachel. And so thank you so much. I know I was really encouraged. I know our listeners will be encouraged and just keep up the good work and what you're doing. Thank you. Glad. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>